Father, as we come to your holy word, may we understand Jesus, may we understand the hope that we have, may we understand the victory that we have in Jesus. We thank you. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Now, for those who have been with us last little bit, we've been going through the, the book of uh, Colossians, a short little book in the New Testament, and we're going to come to the final section starting this morning. We've just finished a section, and if you haven't followed along, we've got lots of uh, old sermons on our uh, YouTube channel, and you can catch up there. But uh, we've just finished a section in which he's been talking about uh, how we are to live out the gospel inside our households. And as we've done that, I've said that kind of at home is the hardest place to live out the gospel. And we're going to come to a bit of a, a transition today. The Apostle Paul is going to bring prayer into the whole idea of what we'll be talking about. Bringing it in to our homes. And he's going to transition a little bit. Kind of mid-thought almost. He's, he's thinking about our homes and he talks about prayer. And as he's thinking about that, he starts to talk about church. And he's going to get very particular. He's thinking not just church in general. He's, he's thinking about his life. He's thinking about the life of the, the people of the Colossians. He's thinking about them. And he starts talking directly to some specific things. So we come to a bit of a hinge between home life and church life. Connecting point we're going to come to is prayer. Prayer becoming a hinge between the two groups. Now, Paul at this point. If you were to be following anybody in ancient Roman Facebook or other social media, not that they had such things, but whatever they did, if you were following a little bit about Paul's life, Everything would look bad. He's in jail. His, the, the, the religious leaders of the day are coming hard at him. The Roman authorities got him locked up. Everything is going wrong. He is defeated. From all perspectives, except God's. From all perspectives except God's, the power of the Almighty continues to rest upon Paul, and Paul willingly submits to a good God, knowing that whatever is going to happen to him, whatever is going to happen in his life, he cannot be defeated. Because God cannot be defeated. God will always be victorious. Now, as we go through this sermon series, I put up lots of pictures of anchors, and this will be the last picture of an anchor I'm going to put up, and probably people are getting tired of looking at anchors. But I've said that this is a symbol that the church used from very ancient times. In fact, the church used it more than the cross as a symbol in the early church. Because of this, there are going to be things in life that are storms. There are going to be moments in life that are really hard. We need to be anchored to something so that we are ready for whatever life throws at us. We're ready for anything. So as we've gone through the book of Colossians, in chapter 1, we said we need to be ready for anything by knowing what God is up to. In chapter 2, we can be ready for anything by finding true freedom. First part of, of, of chapter 3, we talked about being ready for anything by, by looking at life. And the last couple of weeks, the end of chapter 3, the very beginning of chapter 4, ready for anything by being anchored. And now as we come to the, the last section, 
understand a little bit about we can be ready for anything by being victorious. Paul, this guy in prison, writing to people, and they've got some issues, but their biggest issues are things that are yet to come. They don't know what exactly is coming up, but they do know there, there will be bad things. They don't know for sure, but, but what's about to hit this particular church is they're about to have a devastating earthquake. They didn't know it, of course, but we always know there's going to be something that's going to come along in life that is bad. There's always going to be the next thing. Paul certainly not. He's right from jail. We're writing a guy who everybody else in the world is saying, you know what? Your life's defeated. You're in jail. Writing to people who are about to experience bad things, and I'm talking about victory, being victorious. Paul doesn't write to them and say, you know what, things are going to go wrong. What I want you to do is go hide in a cave until Jesus returns, because it'll be safer. He doesn't write to them saying, I want you to ignore all the bad in this world. I want you to pretend it's not there. But in the midst of all the difficulties of life, with all the unpredictable things that come along that seem so threatening, in them know you are not defeated if you are anchored to Jesus. Know you've got possibility. And in just a moment, we're going to put up the verse, and we're going to find out. He's writing particularly. You can pray with thanksgiving. Not in the sense that you are to be unrealistically optimistic. In fact, quite the opposite. You are to be totally realistic with this world and life because you see Jesus. And you know what? This world may have lots of issues. My life might be kind of rocky at times. There might be things I am not expecting to crop up. But Jesus is still the Savior. And that's what matters. So in chapter 4, verse 2, this is a wonderful thing. He writes very simply. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, in our Bibles, there's, there's, there's headlines and there's, there's uh, chapter breaks and things like that. I understand none of them were in the original. Even the chapter breaks, chapters didn't come into like a, a thousand years after the New Testament is done. This isn't so much about a new section as it is a hinge. Now, if you think of a hinge, this worked much better if I was using this mic. Use my hands and hold the mic at the same time. But a hinge, you know, you've got two different parts and they, 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 they move. And one side of the hinge we've just talked about has to do with how, home, household life, home life. The other side of the hinge is church life. And, and this is kind of the hinge as we're dealing with these two topics. Continue steadfastly in prayer about your home. Continue steadfastly in prayer about church. And we've got both parts of it that are, that are in on this. Because in both areas of life, we can very quickly start focusing on the struggles. We can start focusing on everything that is wrong. We can become very pessimistic. That's kind of the natural. It is so easy to start feeling defeated. And prayer is a necessity. But Paul is going to give a prayer with a twist. Now, if you remember, 
There, there's a story in the Old Testament of, of Jonah. Famous story. The guy gets swallowed by a big fish or something. Quite a famous story. And you know, he, he eventually gets out of his predicament. And it is quite a predicament. And he goes off and he does what God's told him to do. And God has said, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. I want you to preach to them. Tell them they're in trouble. They don't repent. He goes there and he starts telling people this. And they repent. And, and Jonah's a little ticked off because the Ninevites are their enemy. He, he really doesn't like them. They are not the people of God. He doesn't want to see them repenting. He sits there and he sulks. And God gets mad at him. And Jonah prays. He talks to God. Jonah's being obedient. He even preaches the gospel. But God is not pleased with him. You know why he's not happy? Despite the fact that on the surface he's obeyed, on the surface he's even praying to God. It's not what things do. He's got an attitude that, man, I want to see God get those folks because I don't like them. I want to see God go get them. And, and he spends all his time complaining. Complaining about all that is wrong. And he misses the good that God's doing. The Ninevites are bad folks. There's lots of things going wrong. They start confessing. They start repenting. This is good. We should be focused on the good. It's, it's got a word in there. Continuous to pass in prayer. Be watchful. Be watchful. This is a word that Jesus uses when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's crucified. And the disciples go to sleep. He's praying. The disciples go to sleep. Could you not keep watch for even one hour? In other words, be alert, pay attention, focus on what you are doing. First Thessalonians uses this word as well. He tells the church, I want you to be watchful for the return of Jesus. Be alert. Prayerful. Pay attention. Pay attention. basic command that he's given. Be alert, paying attention. And we kind of get some awkward phrasing. Whenever you take one language and put it into another, Greek to English, and then in this case it's the New Testament written in Greek language, it's a little bit of an awkward phrasing that's got here. This version says, be watchful in it with thanksgiving. The way you kind of can translate this be watchful in the realm of thanksgiving. In other words, may thanksgiving be over top of everything that you're doing. What are our expectations in life? We're just looking for what's wrong or knowing what's good. It was about 110 years ago now, somewhere in there, the Titanic sank. We all know that famous story. Wow, oh, it's going to be 25 years ago, I guess, since that really bad movie came out. Now. <laughs> so, I didn't like it. Anyways, I know it was popular. You know, uh, a lot of the things we know about Titanic came out of one of two big public inquiries that went on after the sinking of the ship. There were two of them. One of them was hosted by a group of political leaders in down in Washington, D.C. And let me tell you, the journalists laughed up every word and it got thrown all over the newspapers. And everybody everywhere was paying attention to this because it was exciting and it was, it was, it was controversial. And it, it, it was meant to, to bring out all the struggles that went on with that. And, one of the, the witnesses, somebody who was a, a person on the boat, was asked by a politician. You know, they kind of acted like the, sh the ship couldn't sink. And the, 
person agreed. And then, well, that's, they, they asked the next person, well, didn't they act like even God couldn't save the ship? And yet it did. And eventually, it kept getting a little bit more. And eventually, it even came, the captain said, God himself couldn't ship, sink the ship. He never actually said that. It's recorded. It's just, it sold a lot of newspapers. And it, you know, the politicians wanted to be in the newspapers, so they asked things to sell more newspapers. It was exciting. We tend to gravitate to the juicy, to the exciting, and usually the pessimistic about life and others. So there were two inquiries. There was a second inquiry that got no media attention. Nobody paid at all attention. It was various shipping authorities did an inquiry about how do we avoid doing this again. And you know, since they put their recommendations into effect, do you know zero ships in the North Atlantic have struck an iceberg? Now one per now one life is being lost. They did something that changed the rules that made a real difference. Now, everybody was attracted to the one that made people sound bad. But sometimes when we're so focused on what is wrong, we miss what is good. We miss being able to make a real difference. We need to find excitement. We need to find good. But we need to find these things in God. I brought up Jonah earlier. Jonah's eyes were completely, absolutely, on sinners. Jonah's eyes were completely on what was wrong. That was the wrong place for them to be. Our eyes need to be on the one who defeated sin, not on sinners. Our eyes need not to be focused on sin. Sin, when it captivates, even if we're staring at it with condemning eyes, we're looking at what is defeated rather than the one who does the defeat. If we're always complaining about, and then you can fill in the blank, we're not looking at the correct thing. You know, he says here, continue steadfastly in prayer. Prayer focuses our hearts on Jesus. Prayer fills us with expectation of what God can do. This world will never be perfect. I may never see this world do what is right. I may never see all the good. But if all I can see is the bad, I am missing all that God is doing. I need to go to God with expectation, with hope, knowing that I have a powerful God. We need soft hearts that have been broken by trouble. To really be able to understand that Jesus is at work and we need to be watchful, alert, looking to the things that God is doing good because we have a world that doesn't look that way, does it? That doesn't want to find what is good. It is so easy just to look at what is wrong. A few moments ago we sang that, that song, Come Thou it's a song I, I talked about a few months ago, but uh, on Thursday we were we were talking at uh, at uh, worship practice about some of the things that it means, and it's a song that is written by a gentleman who really struggled, possibly with depression. Certainly, in the way that he wrote, he struggled with pessimism. He struggled always finding the negative, and he wrote this song about trying. 
And uh, the question on Thursday particularly is that line that everyone's known you know, about raising your Ebenezer. Because that's such a funny line. And an Ebenezer in his language, in the way that he was thinking, was something positive. You made a memorial from it. You raised up. And you could go back and you could look and say, that was something wonderful. That was great. And all I can see, I wander by, and it always reminds me of a good moment. It reminds me that, yes, there is victory. And, and back when Dickens wrote uh, A Christmas Carol, and that's what we think of when we hear the word Ebenezer, right? Ebenezer Scrooge. He did that very deliberately. He picked the name very deliberately. Because he was supposed to be a character that reminds us of the potential for somebody that evil to be turned to the things of God, the things that are good. Somebody whose life turns around completely and absolutely. We are to be watchful. The things that are wonderful. To be a person of prayer. Just pray, but alert with thanksgiving, bursting. It is true at home where it is so easy to be distracted by the faults of everybody else in the household. It is to be true in the church where Satan would love us to be ineffective people who are consumed with just gossiping about everything wrong. Prayer is staying before God, and it is so important for us, whether we're talking about our lives at home or whether we're talking about church life, to find what is good, to find what is encouraging, to find what is helpful, and to see those things at the forefront of our vision. It is so easy to look at other people and be distracted by, oh, that person did. Or it is so easy to, to look around your life and be reminded, oh, that wasn't bad. We need to be watchful, looking for the things that we can be thankful for. And to live in a spirit of prayer and thanksgiving. Next verse. Look, at the same time, can see a little bit of this transition. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. Pray. Pray for us. Apostle Paul said, pray for me. Pray for my those who are together. We move to a new side of the hinge. Pray that the door may be open, that the gospel may be spoken. And we're going to deal a little bit with that in the next part of the outline. But for now, <coughs> we are trying to declare something with our very lives. Pray for us that that may happen, that the gospel may move forward. Pray, this is Paul, that, that the gospel may be seen clearly. Pray particularly as I declare the mystery of Christ. Now, well, not everybody would be with us, but that might ring a bell if you were with us in January, but hold on. Earlier in Colossians, Paul did talk about this mystery of Christ. Now, we don't have an explanation what is the mystery of Christ. He doesn't really explain it because he has already, way back in chapter 1, and probably nobody remembers this because 
we, we looked at this verse on January 2nd, and we probably all were still recovering from New Year's and Christmas. But back on January 2nd, we, we, we came to a verse in, in chapter 1, verse 27, that talked a little bit about what is this mystery of Christ, and there was a huge section about it. And partway through in verse 27, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches, the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you put it back in this context, really here is, is the mystery of Christ. Those who do not deserve it, those who have no reason to expect it, have the hope of glory. Those who shouldn't get anything from God because they are rebellious people. Those who have messed up in life, those who sin, have the hope of glory. And he calls it the mystery of the gospel. That there is hope for those who should be excluded, those who should be condemned. This is the heartbeat, the Apostle Paul saying, of everything that I'm talking about. This is everything. This word mystery, it is actually it's a, taken directly from the original Greek text. Mystery is a Greek word. Now it is meaning has shifted a little bit, you know, in 2000. Basically, when he's saying this, he is saying this is a secret that is unknowable, except it's kind of leaked out. We could not discover this truth, this, this incredible truth on our own. We could never have guessed that Jesus would bring forgiveness this way. That's what makes it remarkable. This is a truly incredible story. Romans chapter 5. Paul tells that there's a moment where we are not good enough. And he says it like this. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. <coughs> For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we save from him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the heart of the mystery. And can you not listen to those words and just hear, seeping out of them? Paul's excitement, Paul's wonder. I mean, he said this probably a thousand times. He's probably preached hundreds of sermons, gone to all these different places, and said, you know what? I was an enemy of God. God's forgiven me. He's not grown cold in his mind. He is still excited about this. Do you know what? I don't deserve it. I was an enemy of God. And at that moment, Jesus came and he brought me hope because he died for me. He would give up everything for me. Can you not feel his excitement at this moment? It is too unbelievable that God would die for sinners. You know what, really, there's only one way to stay focused to this truth prayer. Spending more time praying that it is his will. He's saying pray that 
pray that I can continue bringing this mystery to the world. Pray that it will go forward. I'm going to tell you right now, that's a dangerous thing to start praying, but it's important. In the Gospels, Jesus is walking along with the disciples, and they look over a field, and uh, it's about harvest time, and he says, you know what, in our world, the fields are ripe. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray that he will send workers. Well, that's a great prayer. That somebody's going to go up there and tell people about Jesus. It sounds like a great thing to pray. The next chapter. Jump ahead one chapter. And Jesus starts to answer the prayer. He turns to the same people he's just said, I want you to pray that there are workers. And he says, now I want you to go. I want you to be one of those workers. We start to pray, God, and we see the gospel move out, and God sends us out. I was in a seminar this week online. It was asking the question, how do we stay on task as the church? in an ever-increasingly angry society where complaining about each other and the world has reached a new crescendo. And the basic bottom line we came up with was this. We as the church surely do not mirror the world. If the world is angry, that's probably a sign that we're not supposed I mean, God has, you know, God has wrath about. We are not angry. We're not God. We are to be upset with sin, and we don't take it that way. But if we're always angry, and the world's always angry, obviously there's something wrong. And the only answer we can really come up with in this, you know, for every time that we're frustrated with this world for every time that words come out of our mouths they're like anger and frustration we're going to get angry and frustrated with them we should be angry with sin for every time we start to speak that way we need to spend more time in prayer we need to spend more time before God that last verse on the screen before. Verse 2 said that we were to continue steadfastly in prayer. In the original Greek, that is one word. Is a word that I, I find it, I, I, I took my dictionary out and looked it up and it was defined this way. Continue to do. Okay, let's continue to do whatever. In this case, it's prayer. Continue to pray with intense effort. In other words, this is hard. You don't do something with intense effort if it's easy. I want you to do this even though it's hard. But it is something that will separate us from the world that says that we are different from our divided, angry world, that we are focused on the glory of Jesus' salvation, that that is something that preoccupies my mind. The world should not distract me from the glory of the fact that Jesus loves people who were his enemies. That Jesus loves me despite the fact that I did things that were wrong. And I gotta bring that message to a world that is struggling. Continues in verse 4. On account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. I think being in prison was an obstacle to Paul. And here it went through, absolutely. But the obstacle is not the issue. everything to run smooth. 
to like to follow certain patterns. And then at some point, an obstacle comes up. Something comes up that's really hard. Or it's just a distraction. Certainly happens here. You know what is very interesting to me? He, he brings out this this is what I want you to pray for. I want you to pray the mystery of Christ over here. I would have thought how we should have prayed was pray for me that I get out of jail. Should have been something like, hey, a, a little while ago, Peter was in jail and God miraculously sent an angel who got him out. Pray for that for me. Pray that happens here again. Interesting. That's not what he's after. Should he pray, hey, there was this guy named Daniel. He got tossed into a prison with lions in it. And God did something remarkable. He closed the lion's mouth. Pray that that'll happen for me. Pray that God does some sort of great miracle and I'm free. That the obstacle suddenly disappears. is not the issue. The gospel is the issue. The things that go wrong in life are not our focus. Jesus, our Savior, who loves us deeply despite the fact that we are sinners. That's what matters. In, in, in Roman times, a prison was supposed to be a temporary holy place while they figured out what to do with the person who was in jail. But Paul ends up spending a remarkable amount of time just waiting for somebody to figure out what to do with him. But that's not his biggest concern. His biggest concern was bringing the gospel forward. There's a great story in the Gospels that the disciples are, are going along with Jesus and they're bringing the good news and they come to a Samaritan village that ignores them. He rejects them. James and John come up to Jesus and say, hey, should we call fire down on this village? Basically, it's like this. Hey, Jesus, shouldn't we nuke them? Jesus rebukes them. He says, no, what we need to do is not focus on this village as reject. Let's go to the next village. Let's bring the mystery of the gospel there. Focus on the message of hope, not the obstacles. We are geared to dwell on the bad and miss the good in our world. But Paul, speaking from prison, says, no, I want you to focus on to focus on love. Is my mic dying? I am having major mic issues. <laughs> All right. Just one more thing. Great. I don't know what's wrong with the one that's on my head, but I think that one just ran out of batteries. You know, we're called on to worship God. Do you think God needs our worship? Do you think it changes God at all? Why do we need to worship God? Do you know who it changes? It changes me. It focuses my heart where it needs to be. And that is the call of God on our lives. In conclusion, you know what? Like I entitled this Act Like a Call. Not in the sense that I want you to act like some person out in the world, but I want you to act like a specific conflict. And that's Paul. Who spends his time calling us to pray, not saying, not complaining, not using all of his energy, not all of his brain power to worry about the obstacles. 
but praising God for all the good that he has, spending his effort, his time, looking at the good. As we worship, as we pray, as we have thanksgiving, it doesn't change God, but it sure changes us. It sure focuses us on good. We desperately need prayer. We desperately need this to help us focus on salvation and the hope that exists for our families, our community, our world. We need to be people who are looking forward to what God is going to continue to do in lives. And it might just change our hearts as we do so. The more we dedicate ourselves to prayer, to looking for the gospel to move forward everywhere, the more Jesus captures our hearts and moves us forward. So we're going to finish off singing the song in Jesus' name, and I'm going to invite our worship team up. And as we sing, knowing that God wants to get a hold of our hearts and does so in remarkable ways. <laughs>